Hi and welcome to the Parent Guide to GCSE.com podcast. This is episode number one and today's victim is John Lamerton. Welcome to the very first podcast by Parent Guide to GCSE. We are here with the fabulous John Lamerton, twice best-selling author and uh, king of routine himself. So we're hoping we can come up with some really useful stuff in terms of kind of setting up routines for your teenager to help them be successful and uh, survive year 11 intact and with some kind of life maybe as well. So John, hi. Hi there, welcome. I was going to say welcome to the show. It's not my show, it's your show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, Thank you for being here. So um, I guess what we what we really wanted to talk to you about is kind of why routines are just the way forward why they're going to make such a big difference that they're worth the the effort because let's face it it's going to be an effort getting your teenager into a routine why are they worth the time and the effort so what can you tell us about the the difference that they've they've made for you for me i mean the the routine has been absolutely key for me and i didn't realize at first how important the routine was i thought i just did things a little bit differently to most people Perhaps I work a little bit harder. Perhaps I just think differently. And I was actually on a, on a US podcast about 18 months ago now talking about some of the success I'd had. And I was on the kind of podcast round doing uh, promotion work, my first book. And we started chatting to this guy and he was delving into, well, what do you do about this? What, what, what does the first 30 minutes of your day look like? What do you do every day? And I, almost every story I had rotated around well every week i do this and every september we do this in the business and this happens automatically and i do this three times a week and this happens twice a day and the host said to me i think for you john i think the routine is key i think you're like the king of routine and i just instantly went oh king of routine yes i'm having that so i i fully embraced um, this little moniker and I went, I went back to our 1% club members and I got announced that, uh, yes, good afternoon guys. I am now the king of routine. Uh, you may know worship at the altar of, of John Lamerton. And one of my clients sent me uh, a t-shirt and this was, comp- I didn't know that he was going to do this. He sent me a printed t-shirt, um, the next week and it had a uh, king of routine emblazoned on the front of it. It's, it's in the book. Um, I took a photo of it and it's, I've absolutely embraced that moniker now, the king of routine, because for me, the routines are, everybody's got routines. Every single one of us already has routines that we follow on a daily basis, just on autopilot. You know, the way you tie your shoelaces, the way you brush your teeth, which trouser leg you put on first, which way you drive to work in the morning. We've all got these automatic routines that we don't even think about absolutely zero cognitive effort goes into them and becoming a routine machine for me was all about optimizing tweaking and developing those routines so that the stuff that i know makes a difference the stuff that i know brings me success happens automatically it happens on autopilot i don't need to think about it i don't need any conscious effort to do the stuff that I know I need to do, but it just happens. Yeah. So, I mean, we've we've both read the book and love the book. I think uh, I've read it twice now, and both times I've I've needed to do it with a pen and paper nearby because I come up with things and I go, oh, I should really do that. Oh, I could build this in here, and that would make my life easier. And uh, I'm kind of, I'm very much of the mindset that. I know a routine will make a big difference and I know it's worth putting in the work and thinking about it and taking the time to set up those, those little differences that are going to make the big difference in the end. So I guess for a, for the, for a listener, the big question is how do I get my teenager into that mindset? How do I persuade them that it's worth making the difference that it's worth taking the time? And that's from an after school perspective. So they get home at, I don't know, three o'clock, three thirty. Yeah. where do we what do they do from that four o'clock onwards where it's possible to start developing a routine that's going to help yeah it's this is the challenge i think for most parents of teenagers uh, and i'm not there yet so i've got a 10 year old and a seven year old but trust me they're, they're acting like teenagers at times so it's trying to enforce a rule that's the hardest part is okay you get home from school 
And I, and I remember this as a kid myself being told, well, if you do your homework, the minute you get home from school, you've got the rest of the day. Yeah, that's great. But when I get home from school, I've just done six hours of work and I want to watch cartoons. Okay. I, you can tell when I grew up, it wasn't, sorry, I want to play Minecraft. I want to go on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, this is what the kids want to do. So it's, it's, I think it's creating that win-win for them that they can find something that is rewarding for them and that makes sense for them. So we just started homeschooling R2. And as part of that, we've, we've actually taken them through the same, the exact same process we take our business owners through. We've sat down, they've written down all the things they want to achieve um, from becoming a famous YouTuber, getting bigger muscles, passing the 11 plus, all these different things. And we then triage that and we said, right, what's the most important? Let's get you working towards these goals. And so Jack, my eldest, has decided that getting bigger muscles is very important to him. Uh, it's what every 10 year old wants to do. So how do we get bigger muscles? What well, we do, we do workouts, don't we? So obviously the king of routine says, well, how do we get bigger muscles? We do workouts a couple of times a week. We do maybe you know four or five times a week. We do a workout. He said, well, I'm going to do a workout every day. I said, well, that's, that's brilliant because you're doing something every single day. You're not going to have to think about it. It's, if it's the most important thing, we'll do that first. So we get up and we do a workout. So Jack did a workout yesterday and he stood right next to me where I'm, where I'm sat now in the office, took his shirt off and went, look at the muscles. I reckon you can see my abs already. <laughs> and I said to him, well, Jack, you've only done one workout. I said, you don't get muscles from doing one workout. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger did not do one workout and win Mr. Olympia. You know, he went from being this scrawny little kid to being Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe, you know, the Terminator, everything we know about Arnie was, and his mantra was reps, reps, reps. It's not what you've done today. It's not what you're going to do tomorrow. It's what you do every day. And to go back to your question about how to actually get your teenagers to sit down and do their homework when they get home, I think you've got to make it rewarding for them. And this is the key element, I think, for anything you want your teenagers to do. If you want them to tidy their bedroom, you don't nag them to tidy their bedroom. You don't have a go at them when they don't tidy their bedroom. What you do do is praise them when they do well. So you reinforce the behavior. There's a line in the book that I used, that I think, what gets uh, rewarded gets repeated. And you'll find this now. If you... If you can encourage them to do the homework the minute they get home from school and say, look, if we do this, then this will happen. So <laughs> thank you, Chewy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say you get home from school, it's four o'clock and you've got an hour's worth of homework to do. So at five o'clock, this is what you announced them at five o'clock, we are going to the park or we are going to play Lego together, or we are gonna go and get an ice cream. We're gonna do something at five o'clock once you've done your homework. As soon as you've done your homework, we're going to do something fun. We're gonna do something enjoyable. We're gonna do something that you want to do, or let them choose. What do you want your reward to be? You know, and it's, do you remember when, when you were potty training the little ones or, you know, trying to get behavior going, you'd have, you'd have a sticker, you'd have a star chart. So let's get some stickers going. Every single day that you do your homework, the minute you get home, you get a sticker. And there'll be a lot of teenagers saying, I don't need a bloody sticker chart. Why, why would I need that? But ultimately, you're reinforcing it saying, okay, you, you may not want a sticker chart, but if you get five stickers, we'll go to that nice gelato place. And once you're at 10 stickers, that's a trip to the cinema. And once you're at 50 stickers, that's a new Xbox game. And you can exchange these stickers, and, but just make it simple to earn one. So actually, if you know your child is going to get in just before four o'clock and they've got an hour's worth of work to do, then earning the sticker happens every time you finish your homework before 5 p.m. or 5.30 or whatever. If you finish your homework before 
the big hand touches the 12 and it's it's five <laughs> o'clock you get a sticker and that is gonna sound de degrading to any teenagers listening i'm sure he's gonna say i don't need a sticker chart i don't need to be told yeah you know, i don't need to be told what time it is but ultimately that structure and that the the ritual of doing that then gives them the freedom from five o'clock until bedtime to do whatever they want and whatever they want without mum and dad nagging them saying you haven't done your homework yet don't forget to do your homework have you done your homework and it creates that expectation so i can now say to our boys and they know that the rules are the rules um no screen time before school okay um jack's practicing for the 11 plus so he's he's done his first exam last saturday he's doing the final one next saturday so he's been doing lots and lots of practice papers so guess how many papers he's done one a day and that's that's the routine is okay first thing you do before you do anything else you're going to do a paper and to begin with that was very very difficult because he didn't want to do a paper and ultimately the the way we got him to do that was to say it's the first thing you do it's the most important thing we're going to do that first every day the days where he would wake up play on his xbox for a couple of hours um watch some youtube videos and then mum and dad would come along and say yeah come on jack you need to do a test that's when the toys got through at the pram because all of a sudden i'm in xbox mode i'm in minecraft mode i'm in youtube mode mum and dad have come and interrupted my fun and told me to do the boring horrible work that i don't want to do that's now going to take me two hours rather than 50 minutes because i'm going to moan and i'm going to whine about it and i'm going to throw my toys out the pram whereas and you know in business terms we talk about eating the frog doing the difficult thing first get it out of the way and then having the rest of the day free now certainly you know i can't vouch for teenagers but i, well, I used to be one but <laughs> as a 10 year old certainly you can't reason with him and say, if you do this first, you're going to have the rest of the day because the logic is just, but I don't want to do that now. So let's just make it rewarding. Let's reinforce the positive when they do do it. And yeah, I'm sorry, but nagging doesn't work. You know, it's, no. believe me, I've tried it and I've, I've been on the other side of it. It doesn't work at all. <laughs> No, and one of the things we've we've talked about in the blog is the um, kind of the brain development side of things and the fact that as a teenager, your prefrontal cortex isn't quite there yet. And that's the part that makes all the rational and sensible and grown up decisions. Yeah. And you're still kind of being ruled by monkey brain a lot of the time. Yeah. What's fun? Let's do that. And uh, so we've kind of we've got that little obstacle there because you, you can't, you can't reason with them because that's not how their brains work. So have you found with, with Jack and with his practice papers, especially, have you found that it's helped that he set himself that goal? Cause you talk a lot in the book about your, like the goals, the desire to hit the goals and, and how that makes a difference. Does, did you find that that, that made a big difference with him that you could remind him this was what you wanted to do. This was the goal you set yourself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's struggled with the 11 plus, not in terms of uh, his capability to do it. When he's doing practice papers, he's scoring high 90%. Um, what he does struggle with is mindset and self-esteem and self-confidence in his own abilities. And we've, we've witnessed since we've been homeschooling him that we can almost split a test paper into two parts. The part where he had a good mindset and the part where he didn't have a good mindset. And I can't remember, I think it was about two weeks ago now, he, he started a practice paper. Um, so the practice paper, I think it's 50 questions and he got 18 questions in and then he hit a hard question. I can't do this. This is rubbish. No, I'm not going to, I don't want to do the 11 plus anymore. This isn't going to happen. This doesn't work. Uh, I can't do it. And it was just tears and tantrum. And we then did a sort of meditation session where we got, had a little bit of a pep talk, got him back and sat with him. He still answered the questions. Um, and then we compared the two points and where he'd had his wobble and 
he had the mindset of, I can't do this. This is too hard. I don't want to do it. He scored 47%. And where I was just sat with him, again, not answering any of the questions, but just reminding him, you're capable of doing this. What is the question here? 98%. So the only difference was his mindset. And that, I think, has been the, the hardest part about doing that. Going back to your question about desire, yes, absolutely. He's now got um, his goals written on a bit of paper that he's coloured in himself, and it's taped just below his television. So every time he's watching Xbox, he's watching Minecraft, if he happens to glance down, there's his list of goals. Past 11 plus, get bigger muscles, get 150 YouTube subscribers. Now there immediately is the power we talk about with our business owners of having a big three, because I've just instantly been able to tell you what Jack's three biggest goals are right now. And the idea behind that is he could also tell you what his three biggest goals are. If you speak to most people, they don't know what they're working towards. Jack does, he knows, and he's set that. Um, for those watching the video of this podcast, you will notice there are some words above my head, and they are my magic ingredients that I talk about for success, one of which is desire. So you've got to truly, absolutely want this. And Jack had a big wobble during the exam last week, and he walked out of the exam room saying, I don't want to do the 11 plus anymore. He's now back on it. He does want to do it because the, the, the fact that he was saying, I don't want to do it anymore, was the monkey brain talking, saying, this is scary. It's hard. Um, one of the boys in the exam, I didn't like him. So I don't want to go to school with him anymore. And it was just that immediate monkey brain keeping you safe, going, right, well, let me take you out of that danger whereby you're going to go to a school that your friends don't go to and you're going to have to do a hard test to get in there and you're going to have to go to this, these unfamiliar places with the teachers you don't know and you're not going to know any of, the, any of your fellow students. Let me rescue you from that and come back to the safety of you just go to the local comprehensive. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. That's easier. That's what I want. Um, that's not what he wants. That's not what he truly wants. That's what monkey brain wants. And again, this is going back to um, Dr. Steve Peters, the chimp paradox is you've got your chimp, you've got your, your human, and you've got your computer brain. And this is about getting the human brain to take over and say, whoa, hang on a minute, Mr. Monkey, I'm driving the ship here. Do you drive a ship, sail a ship, something like that? Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with that. But it's getting the human rational decision to ultimately decide, and the routines are all dictated by the computer. So who's programming the computer? Because it's either the monkey or it's the human. And if you let the monkey program the computer, that's how you end up in McDonald's every lunchtime. That's how you end up no, never going to the gym. That's how you end up doing your homework first thing on a Monday morning when it's due on Monday morning or last thing at the weekend or cramming it in or I haven't quite done the work I need to do. This is because the, the chimp, the monkey, has programmed the computer to run the autopilot scripts. If you can get the human to take over and say, come on, Jack, you do want to go to this school, Therefore, I need to program the computer to get your mindset right, to be able to do the work, to better practice this, to get it done, to do the exam. So the key, I guess, is the, the kind of the prompting question when you're getting that monkey response that, oh, I can't possibly do it. It's all too scary. Is that why remind yourself why you're doing this, I guess. Yeah. So Absolutely. It's motivation and desire is such I mean, motivation is the, the motive to take action. And that is without motivation, but it's sufficient motivation. We can all watch a motivational video and get fired up. So yeah, Jack, before the exam, we watched uh, a nice motivational video. We listened to some uh, Eminem and other pumping tunes on, on the way there. He got out the car, he did some sprints and he went in and he, he said to me afterwards, I went into that exam feeling you've got this, you can absolutely do this. And the first paper 
went fine. The second paper, oh, oh, that's a bit tough. And by the time the third paper came along, the motivation had sunk. And the motivation was suddenly, it's no longer about you've got this, you can do this, you really want this, you really want to come here, um, look at what this is going to do for you. And it went to what's immediately in front of me. This one question, I can't answer this one question. I don't belong here, I can't do this. And it's that self-talk. And ultimately, if, you if your desire is high enough, you'll do what's necessary. It's having that desire, those goals written down somewhere really clear for your teenager to make sure you can always refer back to that, basically. Yeah, I think the key thing with that, though, again, Paul, is Jack's chosen his goals. Because it'd be very, very easy for you as a parent to say, right, your goal is to get, I'm going to say A stars. I know it's not A stars. Is it nines? Is that the top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're going to get nines across the board and you're going to, you're going to score this and you're going, to, you're going to get into this university and then you're going to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor. No, no, no. That's what you want. And I had a quote the other day. I'm going to completely butcher it. But the greatest threat to uh, any child's happiness is the unfulfilled dreams of his parents. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it you know we we as parents do we want the best for our children but ultimately do we want the best for our children or do we want what we didn't get as children and because the desire is so important the the child has to want it themselves it's no good me saying yeah you want you you want nines across the board don't you yes dad do you really want it bad enough to not go and play football with your mates, to not fire up the Xbox, to work through your weekends for 18 months in preparation for this? If you want it bad enough, yes, you do. You will be willing to pay that price. And that is what desire comes down to. Um, I've had this conversation with Jack so many times. Um, I can't do this. Okay, I'll give you £20 if you can do it. Oh, all right, yeah, cool. So you can do it. <laughs> just that your desire, your motivation isn't high enough to do it. So again, if, if you're willing to pay the price, your desire is high enough to do the work. Um, one thing I would, uh, from the book, you talk a lot about um, finding time. And any teenager will probably say, I haven't got time to do the revision that you're, you know, we've discussed or that I should be doing. Uh, and the concept, the thing that you talked about, the stones, uh, the rocks, the stones and the sand. Can you just kind of explain that in terms of a teenager and how probably the revision is the sand that can be fitted into, into the, uh, the, you know, the after school um, time? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the sand, the stones, etc. This is a famous story with, I think it's a philosophy professor. And he stood in front of the class with, with a big glass jar. And he said, I'm going to put these big rocks in, into this jar, screw the lid on, and he holds up the, the jar and he says, right guys, is this jar full? And everyone looks and says, well, yep, you couldn't fit any more rocks in there. It's absolutely full. He says, okay, so he takes the lid off and then he pours some smaller stones in and of course they fall between the cracks of the big rocks. He says, oh, okay, screws the lid back on. Right guys, is this jar now full? Yes, yes, it's now full. Okay, let me get some gravel pour some gravel in. Oh, look, there's room between the gaps in the small stones and the bigger stones. Is it full now? Yes, it is. Okay, let me get some sand, pour some sand in. Now, is this jar full? And of course, everyone's looking at this jar saying, well, there's absolutely no way you could fit anything else in that jar. It's full of these massive rocks, these smaller stones, these pebbles, the gravel, the sand. It's fully compacted. There's no room for anything else in there. Yep, that's absolutely full. And the professor's stood there and he's, he's sipping from his uh, bottle of Evian, other brands of water are available <laughs> and he pours the water into the jar he says there's always room for something else but if you start with water or you start with the sand you're never going to fit the big rocks in there and the big rocks are the important things what we call the immovable objects and when we're working with business owners or whether we're working with you know students we always say start with those immovable objects because if you put your rocks in first you can always fit the sand and the gravel and the water around those big rocks. But if you put the sand in first, and for, you know, I keep coming back to YouTube and Minecraft, but ultimately if you put four hours a day of Minecraft into your jar, you're not going to have room for the big rocks. 
So that's got to go in first. And this is where I think we've talked about, you know, doing it the minute you come home from school. Because if you get home from school at 4 p.m. and you go to bed at, let's say, 10 p.m., I know we're not even going to go there on some <laughs> what time you should go to bed, but you've got six hours. And in those six hours, you have to do your homework. Uh, you have to eat your evening meal. You want to see your friends. You want to get some YouTube done. You want to get on Minecraft. Maybe you want to play with Lego. You want to chat to some of your friends. You want to watch some TV. There's a lot you want to achieve in those six hours. But just consciously think about, well, I've got, to, I've got this big rock of homework. It has to be done. You know it has to be done. It's not, it's not something you can choose whether to do or not. It has to be done. So you've got a jar. It's got six hours worth of room in there. Do you fill that with, let's watch some TV. Let's chat with my friends. Let's go and play football. Let's, you know, let's have tea. Let's watch some TV. Oh, I've got this big rock and I, I can get it in, but I can't quite get the lid shut, um, which is what most of us do. We go, oh, wow, it's, it's 9.15 and I've just got my homework to do. I'm shattered. I'm really, I don't want to be doing this now. And all of a sudden that hour of homework takes you an hour and 20 minutes. Well, you've just lost 20 minutes of time because you weren't effective. If you do it at the start, the hour's worth of homework takes you one hour and you've got five hours of capacity in the jar to fit other stuff around it. It's, it's an interesting concept. It sounds like you're talking to teachers and all their marking, which they start at 9.30 because they put it off and off. <laughs> yep. And it takes them three hours rather than the hour it should have taken them. Yep. So it might be a message for other people in there as well. Oh, oh. Definitely is. I'm married to a teacher, so there absolutely is. <laughs> Yeah, and um, so this kind of, I guess, Sorry. it's creaking. And um, this brings us, I guess, to then the the setting the habits. So in the book, you talk about great ways to set new habits, kind of like associating them with things that you already do and building on existing things to build in new habits, but also though, breaking those bad habits. What would this look like if it was hard? Yeah. So. If I put the Xbox controllers somewhere more difficult to access, then it just makes it that little bit harder and my brain goes, oh yeah, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be doing that yet. So kind of what, what advice have you got for us that might be useful with building new habits and breaking the bad ones? Cool. So, uh, I mean, a good one for that, I, I suppose. I, you may have seen um, the meme on the internet whereby it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mom and she's written to her child and said, uh, once you have hoovered the house and you've cleaned out the hamster cage and you've done your homework and you've done this chore and you've done this chore and you've emptied, uh, you've emptied the dishwasher, then you can have the Wi-Fi password. And yep. it's creating those systems and the rewards whereby once you've done this, you can have this. And you said about um, making bad routines hard to do and that is it could be removing the internet um you know so let's let's imagine we you know so i'm not going to dictate when you need to put your children to bed but if you know that your child needs to go to sleep by 10 o'clock at night let's turn the wi-fi off automatically at 10 p.m every night and guess what that's going to do it's going to force you to switch off earlier as well you're not going to be sat there on facebook at half past 10 going, I'm going to bed in a minute. I'm going to try and sleep. Oh, I can't sleep because my brain's full of all this information. Well, let's turn the internet off at 10 p.m. You could even turn all the light bulbs off if you've got a smart home. And let's just create these automatic, and again, this is the routine machine element of the automatic. Let's remove the decision from the monkey or the human. The monkey or the human does not need to make a decision here. The only thing the human needs to do is program the computer to say at 10 p.m. the internet goes off and it comes back on once you've done a workout in the morning or once you've done your homework when you get home from school. There is no internet until the homework's done. And there's going to be you know, teenagers who will rebel against that. But ultimately, if that is the rule, you very, very quickly adapt to what the rules are. And yeah, the more you can 
how can you make things hard? You can, you've got to add friction and you've got to remove the visual clues. So if the Xbox controller is out of sight, I'm not going to play Xbox. Why am I going to play Xbox? Because it's there and I can see it. Remove the visual clues, um, add friction, make it a little bit harder. Um, so on my phone, for example, I don't want to be browsing Facebook all the time. So I've hidden the app. It's on there, but I've now got to swipe up, unlock the phone, swipe left. Uh, I think it's then the third button down. So I, I've taken something that was just a one click away and I've made it three clicks away, four clicks away. And I've created a rule that again, the computer does automatically now. I don't need to think about it, that when I'm finished on Facebook on my phone, I don't just shut the phone down, I exit the app. So that when I'm next on my phone and I happen to go into the multi-tab or multi-browser mode, I don't go, oh, Facebook, hello, old friend. What we, what, wonder what my friends had for lunch today. And it just, it's, it's removing that or adding that little bit of friction that's making things a little bit harder. Because there'll be, you know, I, I still want to be able to access Facebook. There's still useful things I can do on there, but I want to make it hard enough that I'm consciously going there for a reason rather than the computer, which has been programmed by the chimp, going, oh, how did I end up on Facebook? Where have the last 25 minutes gone? Yep. You um, have an app, don't you, Paul, that you use to see how many times you've picked up your phone. What's it called again? Moments, I think. So whenever he picks up his phone, it's like, oh, this is the 25th time you've picked up your phone today, which is often enough to shame scare me. you. Shame <laughs> yes, me, yeah. shame you into not. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So and there is one of the things I... It so gives you reports the... at the end of the week as well about what you've been looking at, how long you've been staring at it for. Um, it's, it's shameful, frankly, some, some of the time. Three and a half hours a day, some that days. That means you can gamify it. Oh, yeah. You can absolutely, because once you've got some data... And this is one of the things we talk about in the book is we have, uh, so we created this spreadsheet, which automatically tracks. So your 30 day average, your 60 day average, your 90 day average for any habit you want to track. So let's say you wanted to be on your phone less. You've got the data for moments now that literally once a day or, or once a week, you can type in today. I spent 73 minutes on looking at my phone or picking up my phone. I picked up my phone 48 times. And you can just say, all I want to do is get that average under 20. And tomorrow you'll pick it up 15 times. You're like, yes, I'm under my average. And it doesn't matter if you have a bad day or you have a day where you need to do stuff on your phone and you can have a day where it's 180. It's going to push your average up. But ultimately, all you're concerned about is your average. Again, it comes back to what you're doing today doesn't matter. Jack doing one workout is not going to give him muscles. You know, eating a burger today isn't going to make you fat. But if you have one every single day for lunchtime, yes, it will. And it's about routinely optimizing these, these daily habits to serve you rather than to hurt you. Uh, and what's your advice when it comes to phones then and teenagers and revising? Um, I would remove them. I think that, or airplane mode. It's, so I've, I've written two books now. And when I'm writing, I want to be writing. So I've got a dual screen set up here. And obviously the third screen is always within hand. And it's the same for all of us. It's always there. So what do I do when I'm writing? I close down all windows apart from the one I'm writing in and maybe one that I'm doing some research in. When I'm finished researching, that window gets closed because otherwise, where do I do my research? I head to Google. Once I'm on Google, oh, I can end up down some very, very interesting rabbit holes and I can start discovering. I wonder what happened to the cast of Friends. Hmm. <laughs> oh, and then before you know it, I'm on YouTube watching old episodes of Friends. And then, oh, my, what do you know? Matt LeBlanc's got a new show out. Perhaps I should watch that on, on Netflix later. Yeah, I'll do that. Oh, 35 minutes have gone by and I haven't written a word. So for me, I would, I would advise whilst you're revising, phone is off. Um, I love now. 
going back to when I was advising, I used to love listening to music. Um, I don't think I could do that now because I'm taking in the music. Uh, when I'm writing, I have one go-to piece of music, which is a Hans Zimmer song. And it's from the Inception soundtrack. The track is called Time. And it's like a four minute song, no lyrics. And it's just a constant, almost white noise. And it rises and it falls and it rises and it falls. And I stick that song on a loop. So I maybe listen to, when, I'm, when I was writing the book, I listened to that song six hours a day for the entire week that I was writing the first draft. And I got 30,000 words out in that one week listening to the same song. And what that did for me was it just shut down all, you know, you imagine a computer with 150 tabs. <laughs> You're going to have lots of distractions, lots of things going on. Your brain has all these tabs open. So let's close them down. Let's get rid of the phone. Let's turn off the TV. Let's turn off the radio. Let's get some white noise in the background. And that may be getting you know, noise cancelling headphones on and could be your favourite song. But ultimately what will happen with you listen to your favourite artist is you'll end up singing along. You'll end up remembering that time you went to a gig and you watched them play and you think, oh, I love that song. I haven't listened to that song in ages. Do you know what I fancy listening to next? I fancy listening to this other song. And, oh, what's happened to the revision? I've wandered off path. Mm. And if you can actually focus on a single task, you're always going to perform better. You're always going to be more effective and you're going to get it done quicker. And, th th you know, and I know this is, again, we're, we're arguing logic here, but you're going to get it done quicker. You're going to get it done better. And then you can do what you really want to do. And this, we're talking to students, but ultimately we're talking to adults as well about anything that you know you have to do that you've been putting off that's a bit hard because there's always more fun stuff to do. If you can single focus on that, it makes such a difference. Yeah, we've been... Um... There's another app that I'd seen, I think, that can help you gamify that kind of stuff. I think it's called something like Forest, but the idea is you plant a seed and then you put your phone down. And if you pick up your phone and you interact with your phone in any way, your tree dies. <laughs> but if you leave your phone be because you're concentrating, because you're focusing, because you're in the zone, your tree grows and you've got that instant visual reward. And that seemed like a very good plan. Because otherwise, it's just, it's too easy, isn't it? Something pings up on your phone and... Keep the tree growing whilst your phone is sat, and, sat there, because it would be very, in, very very difficult. Otherwise, you'd be sat there going, oh, let me just watch the tree a minute. I think the tree only works if your phone is off. I don't know, I've not tried it. I should. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, again, it's the same reason that, you know, going back to when I was a kid, we had Tamagotchis. Oh, yeah. You know, this little, you know, couple of pixels which was meant to be a cat or a turtle and you had to keep them alive now ultimately you were playing a game there but mm. you were giving you were focusing and choosing where your attention went on a regular basis if you don't you know and that was the opposite of this it was you know you need to pick it up every three hours and press the button to feed it otherwise it dies <laughs> yeah I guess teenagers nowadays, or certainly one of ours in particular, is, um, is very much all about his Snapchat streaks. So on Snapchat, if you Snapchat with someone, I guess once a day, every day, you build up a streak. And uh, I know that on the occasions we've had to confiscate his phone because he's been less than beautifully behaved, he's got quite cross about losing all of his Snapchat streaks because he wasn't able to get to his phone that day. So they, they're all familiar with the idea, the concept of, building up that streak of, of the good thing, the good behavior, the thing that you want to do, which I guess takes us back to the sticker charts. You know, it might not be a Snapchat streak, but if you're working your way towards a reward, that's, uh, that's not a bad way to think about it. And if yours is addicted to Snapchat, as is one of ours, then uh, that's not a bad analogy, I guess, to mm. help them build some routines. Yeah. So what happens when you break that streak though? How do you get back into it? If we're talking about revision or working, um, homework, whatever it is, once you've got out of the routine very briefly for whatever reason, how do you pick it back up and, and get that sticker chart working again? Yeah, this, this is the danger with streaks. Streaks are very, very powerful. Um, so I've just started um, implementing a daily meditation routine now. So I've got the Headspace app. And of course, part of the app is a daily streak. 
well done, you've meditated every single day. Now, a couple of times, the apps failed. And I've done my daily meditation, but I've lost my streak. And when you get to a double digit streak and you're at 18 days and you do day 19, and then it's you go back for day 20 and it says day one, but whoa, whoa, hang on a minute. Where, where are my 18 days? Now, I almost want to message the developers and say, you owe me 18 days here. <laughs> Psychologically, it's so difficult because the minute you've lost the streak, it is very hard to go, right, I need to get back on that horse again because it's very easy to go, oh, well, I've lost my streak. Now it's gone. That's done. I just as well give up. And I think it's just becoming that kind of person that, okay, I've fallen off the horse. I've got to get back on the horse. What was my previous best? My previous best was 18. Right. I need to get to 19. That's my goal. My goal is to, is to beat my previous best. Um, you can use things like the 30-day the 30 average, 60-day average, 90-day average to say, okay, I may, I may have lost the streak, but I've still got the average. You know, I've had one bad day that has lost, it's cost me my streak, but I've still got my average. So I can maintain the average by getting back on it straight away. And then I start building up my next streak. And then I start aiming for my previous best. Now, so that kind of resonates with me because I started doing um, sit-ups, having read your book and talking about stickers, etc. I got to about day 27, something oh. went horribly wrong. And that was about a week ago. So yeah. I need to get back on and get up to number 27, 28 again. Yeah. Easier yeah, said than done, but it's about getting... It is, but I mean, ultimately, if you look at your 30-day your average, you're still looking good. Yeah. But it's getting worse every day that you don't do it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, uh, the quote, the only person you should try to be better than is yourself. Yeah. And just kind of not worrying about what everyone else is doing. Because I think a lot of the teenagers... That we're, we're hearing the stories of are kind of they're looking at their friend who's doing that a little bit better than them and everything seems to be that a little bit easier for them and thinking why can't I do that why aren't I, I must just be really stupid I must you know and that's why I, I really like the idea of trying to beat your personal best that I can I can keep getting that a little bit better that little one percent marginal gain that you talk about in the books that's just adds up to a massive massive difference afterwards so it's just about i guess starting and and keeping going and just trying to motivate yourself to do that kind of stuff and um, now i've remembered the other question i was going to ask you because yeah. i thought it would be useful you talk in the book about when you you so you stopped drinking alcohol yep. and you that was one of the um the bad habits that you decided to break and one of the challenges that you found with it was that it was that kind of the expectation, the reactions from your mates. What do you mean you're having sparkling water at the pub? And I guess if we've got teenagers who are trying to set themselves those great routines and then they've got their mates going, what do you mean you're not coming out? What do you mean you're not going to be on Snapchat in the next hour? What do you mean you can't get on Xbox Live? What's going on? Yeah. What, what worked for you? What advice can you, can you give with that kind of stuff? Yeah, for me, that, that was the hardest part about giving up the booze. It wasn't breaking the addiction um because that wasn't too bad it wasn't really the uh the automatic habit of oh it's friday night what am i supposed to be holding in my hand now it was what the hell am i going to tell my friends because there's this expectation that if we're going out we're drinking and we're going to the football we're going to have some beers we're going to have a curry we're going to have some beers with that if we're going out to karaoke have you ever been to karaoke sober <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice place to be that would not sound good it, it did not. I think, I think personally my singing was better, but, you know, who am I to tell? But that was, for me, the hardest part was actually going out and telling people. And I lied to begin with. And I just said, I don't really feel like drinking tonight. You know, I, I don't really, In my head, I thought, no, I've given up. But I still said to her, I just don't feel like, I'm, you know, I'm feeling a bit under the weather or I'm driving. And I just, I'd make an excuse that was socially acceptable. Oh, I can't right now. So... Ultimately, you know, teenagers can use excuses. Mum and dad have told me I can't. Um, yeah. You know, you may want to do something. You may say, yeah, actually, I want to pass this exam. I want to do the revision. I want to do the work. But ultimately, you can blame your mum and dad and say, my mum's making me do this. 
my mum won't let me have the Wi-Fi password until I've done my revision. How how awful is that? I mean, you know, what's the number for child line again? You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it is finding these lines that are socially acceptable and peer pressure. It, it just, oh, it's, it is a horrible, horrible thing. And we all succumb to it. Um, one of the things that really, really helped for me was negative peer pressure. Um, and it was a member of my family. Um, we were at a like family Christmas meal uh, in early December. So I'd given up for about a month at this point i had gone maybe maybe four weeks without anything and we went to the, this family meal uh what do you want to drink john i'll just have a glass of water please oh you're not drinking no no i've i've um i've, I've i think at this point i was ready to say yeah I've, no I've, i don't drink anymore i've given up and a close member of my family went yeah i give it a week <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I mean, initially I was very, very peeved. And I was like, well, thanks for your support. You know, that's, that's really good. I've made this decision. I've kind of got over the hardest part of it. Well, no, I hadn't. Because in my mind, I was thinking it's Christmas coming up. It's New Year's Eve coming up. How am I going to get through party season, Christmas season, you know? Um, and then, yeah, initially I just thought, you know, why, you know, thank you for your support. Really appreciate your help there. And then I dug my heels in. And it became, well, I'll show you. So actually it was a little bit of reverse psychology by a member of my family not believing in me and not thinking that I can do it almost became, well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove to you that I can. And even now, that's why I think I've included that line in the book uh, six year, well, nearly six years later um, of I give it a week. Well, it's been six years now, so... <laughs> 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 but I, th I think that comes back to a lot of peer pressure you know there's a lot of very successful business owners who are i think as successful as they are and as driven as they are because of bullies at school and teachers telling them they were no good and, and there you go you see everyone's got this story <laughs> of somebody told me once i couldn't do something or i was never going to amount to much or that this was all this was always going to be my destiny and ultimately, a small part of you rises up and goes, I am going to prove you wrong. So what's your story, Emily? I'm dying to know this now. Oh, this was just going back to teaching. And uh, I'm, there were just there were people that I worked with who were not the most positive or the most pleasant to work with. And uh, we've, uh, I've talked with the, the people on, who subscribed to my emails about the, the effect that it had on my mental health. And, uh, and it's eventually, it's the reason I'm not teaching anymore. It was, uh, it was toxic going into work. And I thought for a long time that I just, I didn't really have a choice. You know, I I trained to be a teacher straight, straight out of uni. That was all I ever wanted to do. And I'd done 15 years at that point. And I thought, well, what else can I do? I can't go and start again in a new career. That's ridiculous. And, uh, and then kind of gradually the seeds all were sown and things came together and and I realized that actually I did have various skill sets that I could use in a different way and I could build that stuff up and and a little part of me I will admit is uh, is still going ha you didn't think you thought that you were better than me yeah. you thought you could lord it over me forever and ever and now look I've escaped you're busy marking mock papers so ha 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 yeah. and <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's been very much about proving proving to myself that I could do it. But it's yeah. there's that little voice in the back of my head that kind of wants them to know as well. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, think, yeah. I don't know if you will have seen it yet, but one of the uh, one of my emails for the one one percent club members, uh, it's quite early on, I believe, is written to uh, Mr. Hammond, who was my GCSE English teacher, uh, informing him that I'm now a two-time best-selling author. <laughs> 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 yeah it's amazing the power it can have that um determination to uh to show them yeah yeah <laughs> mr hammond probably doesn't even remember who i am now but <laughs> 25 years later i remember who he is i bet it felt good writing that email i'll bet oh it did absolutely it was so cathartic because ultimately 
there's a reason I remember that conversation and, and that particular line that he used 25 years ago. And it made such an impact on me even now to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Uh, well, I think we're getting towards the end of uh, your time, probably, John. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much um, once again for having thank me. Thank you very much uh, for all your advice and uh, fabulous ideas, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's been an absolute delight. And I'd just like to probably take the opportunity to recommend that if you haven't yet, you should read Routine Machine by John Lambton, available in all good bookstores, so long as they're called Amazon. Is that still? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's also a great one to probably get your teenager to read as well, because as I said, every time I read it, there's something new that jumps out and I think that would make a really big difference. I should definitely do that. And most of them I then get round to. It's not quite all of them yet. I'm still working on it, but <laughs> I will get there in the end. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a lovely routine to get your teenager into. If you can get them reading personal development, self-help books, it's a lifelong skill that will stay with them. And ultimately it just makes everything easier. Yeah, absolutely. It does. It really does make a massive yeah. difference and it is, it can be quite a small time investment, can't it? So mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to be the very first guest on your podcast. Well, thank you. I, I don't think we could have chosen a better one. So uh, bless you. Well, we'll find out in future episodes, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 just, just one more thing, actually. If anyone does want, um, I've got a free chapter of the book um, available if anyone wants to download it. Um, it's available at the website, which is routinemachine.co.uk. So go there, grab a free download of a free chapter. We shall make sure we put the link underneath the, uh, yes. the podcast for you. Fantastic. Right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much for being up with us. If you'd like to know more about how you can support your child through their GCSEs, then head over to parentguide to GCSE.com. See you next time.